Hello and welcome to Innovation Mind Spotlight series. Each month we are talking with top leaders and innovation experts about their ideas, strategies, tools and experience to help the world continue to innovate and thrive. I'm really happy to have two of the leaders of the industry and good friends of mine joining us today. Ashish Kumar Singh, managing partner in Capstone Legal. Ashish heads the early case assessment and internal investigation practice at Capstone Legal. And he has appeared in more than 500 cases before various constitutional and trial courts in India. He is considered to be an avid innovator and an expert in legal document review. Recently, he was awarded the prestigious KNH Trust Pegasus Scholarship. Amit Popat is our next guest. Amit is a practice head for equality, diversity, and inclusion at Capstone Legal. An innovative and bold leader with significant international, multi-sector experience of delivering diversity and inclusion transformation. Acting as an ambassador for cultural change, always approaching sensitive cultural issues with tact and diplomacy. So without further ado, let's dive in. Whether we agree or not, uh, maybe legal uh, world is one of the last bastion to embrace all this innovation disruption, right? So when you're coming from legal world, and on the other side, seeing your leadership championship on innovation and as well as diversity, equality, it's so kind of refreshing. Can you tell me what is the backstory, how you started and uh, how you two meet and also you bring in your partners on board. So Soon was started uh, way back in 2013. And the idea was to provide a boutique law firm which has a global perspective. And that's something which we are trying to achieve. Uh, we, have, we are constantly adding new practice areas. And one of the areas which we found that law firms per se are lacking is the area dealing with equality, diversity, well-being, inclusion. That was not there. So in order to bring leadership in that particular area, uh, we engage Amit Popat, who's also on this call, and he's considered to be a leader in his field, a subject matter expert. So we are bridging two areas. One is the area of law coupled with subject matter expertise. So that was the idea of having this specialized area of practice. And I think to begin with, let us set our own house in order. So we decided to first go after law firms and convince them to, to innovate. And that's the reason why we are here today. When you talk about diversity, equality, did you talk to any fortune teller that, hey, in 2020, we are getting into this interesting situation of <laughs> social unrest, inequality, and all those things? So it's such a coincidence, <laughs> right? When you see so, your championship on one side and also the timely need. Bob. That is true. But, but we also know that diversity is such a live experience in <laughs> the world. So, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it is quite timely that all of these issues in America uh, you know, have come to play. But at the same time, diversity is a fact. It's, it's, it's kind of a reality of life. And we know that these issues exist anyway. Um, it just so happens that there's been a heightened attention because of what's happened uh, to George Floyd in America. Otherwise, we all recognize that this is something which is like to organizations becoming successful. Um, so it just so happens that we are in this time where so many organizations recognize that they need to take some really positive actions to make sure that you know changes are being made at a local level. Awesome. So you're spot on, Amit and Ashish. It's very timely, right? So I'm actually speaking from the heart of all these happenings from Silicon Valley. So I can see that how much relevant your leadership is at these kind of challenging times. So with that, uh, why don't we talk about or do a little bit of deep dive in terms of the uh, maybe global state of law firms innovation. So what are the trends that you see when it comes to innovation, especially around the legal world and law firms across the globe? So what are the common trends and what are the recommendations, advice you may give for our audience? I, I you know, the primary reason is that I think businesses have the power to change a lot of things. So as, as a human being, as a person who's working, we spend one third of our time in a business place. So I think that's the place 
where we can actually make a difference. And law firms all over the world are now employing people from a diverse range of backgrounds because we have seen in the last 20 years the advent of international law firms where law firms would be practicing in different jurisdictions all over the world. And obviously, you interact with clients and employees who are from a diverse background. Now, how do you deal with that situation in an organization which itself uh, may not be that diverse at the top? So that's something which is the basis and the reason why I think those are the trends that we are seeing. And it's going to be more diverse in the years to come. So that's the reason why it is required to nip this in the bud and ensure that law firms, which are basically for getting people justice, getting people their rights, they should set their house in order. And that's the reason why we are starting with law firms. And I think Amit can add to that as to what are the latest trends subject wise. Mm -hmm. place right now where organizations around the world recognize that if they get diversity and innovation, right? And the reason why the two things go together really well is because of the issues of change that organize, you know, when they're driving a diversity agenda, people have to change. The culture has to change and the structure has to change. And the same with innovation. So it's really important, particularly now with global organizations, that they learn to embrace change at a personal level, a cultural level, at a structural level, but has a place where they can do that in an efficient way. Growth of technology with the platform that we're sharing with you, there's plenty of opportunities for organizations and individuals to think, okay, how can we take away some of the difficulties of engaging with the diversity and the innovation agenda by having a platform which is easily accessible and people feel that they can participate in without some of the pressures that go along with the agenda? Because when people start to think about diversity, yeah there's almost a level of um, sense of, are we doing something wrong? And what we are saying here is, we're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. what, we are, what we are thinking about is, how can your organization and you as individuals in an organization improve? So that's where we're starting from. Um, and because thinking around innovation has progressed with technology, it makes sense to bring the two agendas together for us. And we're also finding that the leading organizations out there, successful in terms of their business outcomes, in terms of profits, also in terms of their staff retention, they are doing really well with diversity. Mm -hmm. And we want to try and ensure that organizations gain the best from that thinking which we are experiencing around the world and we get asked to actually do some work with. So um, we, it's a really good time to start to merge those agendas together. And I would say I can actually uh, easily correlate uh, the trends that you're seeing from legal world with the overall trend that we are seeing among our clients globally, I would say. It looks like uh, law firms and legal world is also coming to into our lock and steps with other uh, uh, kind of functional areas. So we talked about global side, right? I know that you're having big presence, especially in India and UK. So are these kind of global challenges or kind of trends that you're seeing are applicable for India and as well as UK market? Are you having your own set of challenges, opportunities? And also speaking of that elephant in the room, COVID on our backyard, <laughs> uh, what are the challenges, opportunities you're seeing in those markets, India and as well as UK? I'm, I'm sure both of us some, you know, have something to say about this. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, what we are finding is in the UK that organizations which are developing good diversity and inclusion practices are more likely to get partnerships and contracts with other organizations. Exactly. Um, the public and the attention on diversity out there is that the consumers actually feel that if an organization is more inclusive and diverse, they're more likely to take their business to that organization. So these are the things that we are seeing currently in the UK. There's a heightened awareness about the diversity agenda. Um, organizations in the UK also are a bit more advanced, I would say, in terms of how they implement diversity practice uh, because the legislation, legal legislation, has been around for a long time and organizations know and leaders know that they need to make some of these changes if they want to be successful. Now, it's not to say that isn't happening in India, but if mm -hmm. India wants to be a... a, a 
competitive environment if organizations in India want to work with people around the globe, if they want to be successful in their own area, then learning from some of the work that's going on in this country is going to be very important. That doesn't mean to say that India hasn't got good ideas around diversity that England and UK couldn't learn from. So I think we are in an opportunity here right now where both countries can start to think, okay, what are the things that the UK are doing at an organizational level, at a strategy level, and at a leadership level, which India is still catching up with, but also what are the unique challenges that India has with diversity that we can actually learn from in this country as well. So I think there's an opportunity for mutual asset knowledge exchange around the diversity agenda. Um, but I do think that from an organizational perspective, there's lots that can be learned from the UK perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Certainly adding to that, <clears throat> particularly in the Indian perspective, we are seeing that there are several Indian multinational companies that have now started having operations all over the world, yeah. uh, which exposes them to legal challenges, which exposes them to lawsuits and sometimes very expensive ones, both in Europe as well as in the US. Now, to tackle that, to, in order to ensure and hedge that risk, it is important that organizations embrace these practices in their cater. It should happen as things are. So I think those practices, can, we can pick it up wherever we find them most suited to. For example, England may have a certain set of rules. If it's suitable to India, they can be adapted to that. There are certain policies that Indian companies might have that might find some uh, you know, that can be adapted to English rules. So I think there is a lot of scope for collaboration, particularly given the fact that India has now become the fifth largest economy in the world, which means that there is going to be a growing commercial interaction between the India and the rest of the world. So we have to catch up and ensure that these policies are also followed in organizations, particularly with law firms as well, but more particularly with companies that have a multinational presence. I think that's, that's the starting point. Ah, awesome, awesome. So uh, since actually you talked about this particular uh, situation there and also opportunities, I recall one of my conversations with uh, California AG Attorney General. And when I was talking to him about the opportunity he sees with innovation, he told me that uh, Bala within US, there is a huge problem when it comes to law or legal, which is a justice gap. So what he mentioned was, one in four persons who are in need of the legal help can only get the legal help, whereas three out of four, they're not even thinking about getting the legal help or they can't afford or they don't know how and where they will be able to get the help. So my charter for the innovation is that how do we bridge that gap? So he calls that as a justice gap, right? So. Do you see that prevalent in UK or India, or this is maybe widely available for common public? And if so, what is the role innovation played there, especially the law, law firms innovation? Uh, we do see in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so there are big issues around access to justice in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we, and, and we recognize that certain groups of people linking that back to diversity. So if you're from a particular diverse group, there may be some challenges in to, to actually access justice through the system, which is very complex. So one of the things that we are looking at at the moment is public legal education in this country. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that more communities and individuals from diverse backgrounds who are finding it difficult to access justice, if they have a better public legal education, then that is gonna help in terms of their outcomes that they're looking for. Obviously, there's another issue in terms of resources and you know, people having the right level of finances. And how do we actually bridge that economic gap between individuals who can't afford services to the legal services who can actually adjust the services that they are delivering in a way which actually meets their needs in some way of um, uh, doing something which is more accessible to them and providing services through networks which allow that to happen. So innovation can come in place in both of those areas by creating platforms where consumers can actually feel that when you're accessing legal services, how can innovation be used to simplify the legal process? Mm -hmm. And also, how can they access people who are willing to go beyond the call of duty often to actually support people who are from, let's say, less advantaged backgrounds? India takes a different flavor completely. I mean, 
India is facing not a problem of race per se, but a problem of caste and a problem of religion. So the same problems that uh, England is facing or the US is facing in terms of race and uh, inequality, the same reason, the same thing takes a different flavor in India. It becomes a caste and it becomes uh, the religion of the person. And access to justice, uh, one of the ways that probably India is trying to bridge the gap is through supporting legal aid. Uh, but certainly there's, uh, there's a requirement that companies and law firms become, if they're more inclusive, then they're more likely to support such people. Yeah. And that's the objective. Yeah, that is true. That's spot on. Wow. So uh, speaking of innovation, especially we are living in this challenging, interesting and uh, uh, kind of opportunistic time, right? With all this COVID-19 and also social distance, remote work. Uh, some of the common themes that we are hearing from innovation leaders, especially from uh, legal departments or HR or even it could be from innovation R&D departments from enterprises and as well as law firms. They are citing two or three common um, kind of constraints why they are not really moving forward with innovation to the extent they like to. So what is really stopping them? When we are doing these kind of brainstorming, they usually cite few usual suspects. Maybe we are not having the scalable processes or we are not having the tools or a dedicated designated team for really championing this innovation within my organization could be one thing, or it could be, hey, my culture is not allowing, so we are really going fast and we won't really focus on our core product, core business. We don't have time for really going outside the comfort circle, culture doesn't allow. So those are the usual suspects on one side, right? On the other side, we recently started hearing even more two or three common patterns. The first one is pretty much most of the law firms or companies are working remote now. At this point, we want to sort out how do we continue to focus on the business as usual without any disruption. So innovation may actually take a back seat. Or sometimes they may say that, hey, uh, the budget is going to be really a question because there are so many things that we have to focus at this time investing more on innovation is not a good thing or I'm not going to be getting much of the support from the leadership team. So when you just look at all these constraints, what is your recommendation? What is your advice towards leaders out there who are trying to balance? How do you really actually keep the ship floating and also thriving and cruising at the same time, not losing the focus on the innovation? I mean, for me, it's how does innovation add value to what I'm doing. I don't want to see innovation as something which is an extra thing that I have to do. So having some information and some knowledge and an idea about some of the skills that I may need as a leader is really important. And knowing that innovation is a, uh, an area which is going to help solve the, the problems that I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not something which is going to add to my problems and add to my time and energy which I already have to deal with, with a very busy schedule as a leader in an organization. I, you know, leaders and, you know, myself and other people are probably looking for a really easy to understand concept of innovation, which means that they are taken step by step to be introduced to innovation before they can actually embed it. So I would say that there's something there about the mindset right now with people is, uh, and, and, and that can go along with diversity, although we have a legislative structure around diversity, which we don't have for innovation. So there's a difference there. And there's also an opportunity to use diversity and innovation to drive innovation, right? Um, so I would say that, you know, make it uh, not only for, for leaders, but for an organization, all of their workforce. What are the benefits for innovation for me? Uh, and as soon as I understand that, I'm more likely to start to engage with an innovative process or the agenda. Ah, that's spot on. Yeah. Uh, I use a term for this. It's called measurable impact. Whether organizations are likely to embrace change if they see and they can measure the impact of a particular uh, event. For example, what, what would be the benefit, as Amit has pointed out, what would be the benefit to the organization? If the organizations could actually measure it, 
in terms of you know diversity is a number it's a numbers game how many people are there inclusion is a is a cultural change it requires time that's a measurable impact and that's something which i think coupled with technology you know the platform that you have developed i think that can be measured using that once you can uh, inform leaders or once you can tell the leaders that you know this is the change that would happen if you do this the human psychology automatically goes in favor of that so i think i think measurable change is something which uh, which one has to really innovate in <laughs> so as to say no i think that that's spot on yeah good 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 so uh, we've been talking about this diversity inclusion and as well as equality consistently continuously right so that is very refreshing so capstone is having any particular framework that you're teaching your enterprise clients or law firms or how are you approaching this big problem that everybody is trying to solve at this point what is your philosophy what's your approach towards getting the clients towards true north our philosophy and framework is about how we ensure that organizations recognize that there's a need for diversity mm-hmm. so actually doing some work to you know get people to pay attention first and then actually giving them an opportunity to participate in some diversity programs which are not that time consuming which are impactful which are bite sized to actually start them on the journey because this is a new journey for capstone as well so we are starting at a place where we recognize that organizations are looking for solutions uh not only which are going to be quick fixes or off the shelf we want to support organizations with something which is unique to them so that's something that we are thinking of doing is actually tailor making some learning opportunities creating some learning platforms so organizations can uh come to us from different places in the world not only india and the uk so if anybody wants to learn about diversity and what the key drivers for diversity are what are the key components then we're going to start to actually create some of those educational platforms once we've done that we'll start to recognize that organizations need a proper framework to ensure that they can engage with the agenda which is going to be meaningful for them so those are the two approaches that we're doing so we're going to get people into some taster sessions with us and then actually show them that these are the real benefits that you will experience as an organization what is the added value what is the added impact and by giving them that lived experience through the the workshops that we will be running hopefully that will start to create more engagement for people because i believe that if people are going to be successful with diversity they really have to know that there is evidence out there and how other people have actually benefited from their engagement with this agenda so that's what we're going to be starting to do is it, it so it's it's going to be theory but it's also going to be really embedded with some real evidence to say this is how diversity is going to benefit you Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, within our US uh, clientele, and as well as uh, when we are talking to most of the global uh, clients, many of the leaders are uh, showing or at least exhibiting the appetite that hey, I want to have some sort of brainstorming or coalition alliance with like-minded folks, especially who are championing this diversity, inclusion, well-being. so for those folks how can they reach out to you do you have any website that they will be able to see or hear about your practice how you are helping your clients your success stories or maybe they will directly reach out to you i'm just trying to connect the dots here how we can bring in all these like minded leaders who are really trying to make a change in the world now i i think it starts with our own clients so as a law firm we have several clients mm-hmm. and those clients have general counsel they have thousands of employees and if we add the number of clients that we have and the number of employees it would run in several hundred thousands so that's the starting point for us and then has as amit has pointed out slowly things would reach us obviously we have a website uh, and obviously people can reach to us through the website but i think more more uh, we should be able to connect with them at certain level they mm-hmm. should have that trust in us mm-hmm. and uh, with with amit's expertise in the subject matter with his experience in the field i think we can build that trust and that's what is required and innovation mind is also working on the same platform the same trust platform so that's that's something which we want to build yeah awesome linking awesome. into the, to, to that um 
there's this concept in the diversity and inclusion space called psychological safety. So how we, we know uh, that anybody working uh, for any organization, if they are psychologically safe and they can bring themselves to work, their performance levels are going to go high. Okay, so this mm -hmm. is research speaking, saying that if people feel safe going into an organization, which is also linked to trust, then actually people are going to perform better. That's exactly what we want to create with our work around diversity. We don't want people to actually feel, you know, um, that they are going to be uh, put in a situation which is going to be so challenging that they're not going to be able to engage with us. We want to create an environment where we recognize that there's growth for all of us um, in the diversity agenda, we are all going to be learning together. We want to co-create, and that means working with other people, mm -hmm. solutions for diversity based on their experience. Because we believe that everybody actually has experience of diversity because they are human and they have an aspect to their identity, which is different to other people. Everybody has an age, for example. Everybody has a gender. Everybody has an identity. So what we want to say to people is that you are already diverse. Mm -hmm. And how can we ensure that that diversity is embraced in a way where the organizations you work for are going to be safer for you to be involved with and therefore performance and what you are doing is going to be somewhat improved as a result of that. So through that psychological safety concept, we want to bring that to the education of diversity. We don't want people to feel nervous about the agenda. It is about change. It is outside of the comfort zone. So we recognize that, but we want to do that in a safe, nurturing space. Awesome. So it's really, uh, it's like music to my ears when you talk about the combination of psychological safety and as well as co-creation on the other side. Right. That's, that's beautiful. So uh, since we quickly talked about the two organizations coming together, Stone on one side and then Innovation Minds, what do you think are the opportunities as we move forward? I'm not talking about just the situation that we are in now during this COVID-19, beyond the COVID-19, there is going to be a new world out there, right? So what are the opportunities these two organizations coming together and creating the alliance is going to uh, help with the clients or why clients should care about these two organizations coming together? What is the power of bringing these two forces? In, in your opinion, maybe Ashish or Amit, can you just share some thoughts? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, go first on that one. Uh, just based on the, the conversation that we have just had, that trying to build a level of psychological contract with people, with the agenda, from people around the world, Innovation Minds and Capstone come together to actually create that space where people can easily engage with us through some of the technology platforms that Innovation Minds provides we can tailor them either for innovation work or diversity work where anybody in an organization can engage directly through workshops. They can engage on a, on a page to share their thoughts about diversity. It can be done in a way which is anonymous. So not everybody needs to know who is contributing. It, it, again, that brings that level of psychological safety. And therefore the engagement level that we have is something I think for the first time that we will start to see a higher rate of people participating with the diversity agenda to allow for true co-creation. So I think that that merging together with the solutions that you have linked to diversity is something which is going to be new, re refreshing, and also very participative. Awesome. That's pretty uh, insightful, I would say, Amit and Ashish. Maybe uh, as a parting thought, uh, recently, I was talking to one of my friends who is a general counsel for a big or large enterprise. So we were talking about how he is seeing the innovation failure and all those things. And then he kind of shared with me an anecdote which is kind of resonating with me. So he told me that, Bala, if you look into some of the Hollywood love stories, or most of the Hollywood love stories, most of them falling into two categories. It, it goes like this, right? Uh, boy meets a girl, boy loves the girl, boy gets a girl or boy loses the girl. So when it comes to the end, there are always going to be binary. He gets her or actually he loses her. 
So my friend told me that, hey, when you think about innovation, it's not always going to be binary. Either you're going to be winning right away or you're going to be losing it. There is a third option that boy loses the girl to win her back. So his point was that when you're embarking or when you're getting into this kind of disruption and also embracing innovation and trying to venture into this new territory, you should always actually have that resilience and also thoughtful approach in terms of embracing the failure if it is going to happen and then how you're going to be recovering from that and still trying to march towards that kind of successful true north. So when it comes to legal world, it is so refreshing to hear and also see that leaders are seeing that failure as one of the acceptable norm, right? Not like actually making that as a default destination. Yeah. As you move on, failure may happen. So having said that, what is your approach when it comes to these kind of failures and what do you recommend or what do you coach your clients and what is Capstone's ideology with this one? See, as lawyers, we are used to failing because, you know, uh, there are two outcomes of a case. You lose or you win. So we are pretty used to that. But with each loss, uh, what law firms tend to do is that they analyze it. Why did we lose? What was the reason why this did not succeed? And probably that's what the platform can do for any organization. So it can basically measure where did it go wrong, even if it goes wrong, although that's not the objective. So I think, I think uh, law firms would be more inclined to go for the platform or to subscribe to the platform's ethos and Capstone's ethos as well. Uh, because it is a part of our, eco, our own ecosystem. And that's something which, is, which we are giving to others. And that's something very important. The first question which a fellow law firm would ask me is, do you have these things yourself? My answer should be yes, otherwise things won't progress any further. Mm -hmm. So, and Amit would agree with me, uh, with me on this. Uh, so that's something which we are trying to do. And mm -hmm. that's why I see this so-called innovative approach for law firms going to be and it's going to be successful because as lawyers we always tell our clients you're going to win right mm -hmm. so that's the primary objective <laughs> and yes if we lose we are going to innovate and try to win again <laughs> ah, okay <laughs> we also see uh, you know on, on a more general point around failure and failure is not the undertaker it's the educator mm -hmm. so bringing that principle to play is really important for us when we're working with legal firms or organizations outside of that. Inevitably, that things are going to go wrong in any organization or with any individual working on a program. But we think that that is the, we can utilize that to actually contribute to innovation. So what is the edge? What is the education that has come out of that? What is the learning that has come out? And how can we actually use that to contribute to an innovative way of working, but not actually seeing that as a place where people or organizations feel that, you know, this has been too drastic, that it's debilitating for them. Productive dissatisfaction. If you fail, be uh, dissatisfied, but how can you use that in a way which is productive? Awesome. So I think almost uh, we are in the top of the hour. So I would say that this is so inspiring conversation. And also I'm just walking out of the call with uh, much more optimism that, yeah, we will be able to conquer all the challenges out there, right? With this kind of legal innovation, law innovation, and also a balanced approach on diversity, inclusion, and as well as belonging. So keep up the, I mean, actually keep fighting the good fight. And I'm really looking forward to all the great things that we can do together as two organizations, Innovation Minds and Capstone. Thank you for your time, Ashish and Amit. Good luck. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us, Bala. Thank you so much.